Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, I think we'll get going. Thanks for your patience for those of you who um, have logged on early. Um, really appreciate it and a uh, big warm welcome to everyone who has joined us tonight. Uh, I want to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands um, that we are uh, all um, distantly gathered on today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, my name is Jessica Haightley brown and it's my pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's webinar. This event is hosted by the Victorian Committee of the Australian Evaluation Society, or the AES, um, which is a member-based organisation which exists to improve the theory, practice and use of evaluation for all of us involved in um, the various practices of evaluation including um, evaluators, managers, teachers and students of evaluation. So um, welcome to uh, all of you. Um, tonight we are really fortunate um, to have uh, Dr Alexander Siari with us today to help us explore how we can apply behavioural science to evaluation methods. Uh, Zan is a research fellow with Behaviour Works Australia and Behaviour Works Australia, you may know, is an applied behaviour change research unit at the Monash Sustainable Development Institute at Monash University, though uh, Dan, Zan himself is based in Sydney. Zan is trained as an experimental social psychologist, um, and since joining Behaviour Works Australia, he has established a behavioural insights team in a large organisation, led the development of a tool to scale up behaviour change interventions within the Victorian government, and led an applied research project to identify and surmount the business barriers to a circular economy by brokering collaborations between government, academia and industry. So he's clearly got great expertise in this space and we're looking forward to him sharing it um, with us today. Um, but before I hand over to Zan, I just want to um, note a couple of housekeeping points. So first of all, um, we are recording tonight's webinar and that's so that we can make it available um, to those who are able to join. But just be um, conscious of that. Um, if you prefer not to have your face recorded, um, feel free to uh, have your camera off. Um, and please stay on mute um, so we don't, the recording doesn't capture any background noise, you know, in your homes and so on. Uh, the, Zan has prepared um, the way Zan has prepared the session is that we will break um, periodically for some Q&A and we're going to do the Q&A within the chat box. So I'll uh, moderate that and uh, pick out some things as we go um, to, uh, to throw to Zan. Um, so you can feel free to pop things in there as they occur to you or to answer the specific discussion questions that Zan poses um, as he gets going. So, um, well, without any further ado, uh, I will hand over to Zan to commence the webinar proper. Thanks very much, Jess. Um, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to, uh, to speak this evening. And thank you all of you for coming uh, in Sydney. It is a cold, cold uh, Wednesday night. Um, so uh, wherever you're joining, I hope you're uh, staying warm and uh, interested to hear a bit about behaviour science um, and what I uh, would so arrogantly think to say that it can talk to evaluation in terms of measurement, implementation, influence. So uh, just before I share my screen, as Jess mentioned, there are a couple of points throughout uh, the session this evening where I wanted to prompt some questions uh, for you to reflect on your own practice, uh, theory and research. Um, specifically thinking about you know behavior and behavior science um, and but rather than kind of wait until those points uh, to prompt you with those questions i'm actually going to periodically paste in chat uh, those questions themselves um, so uh, if you see a message from me in chat you know feel free to take a look at it um, have a think about it um, and and ask a question about it and during these periods uh, basically at the end of each section um, i'll take a moment to uh, uh, to put them up on screen again for you to reflect and then ask some questions as well. Um, so the first set of questions that I'm popping in chat right now, uh, just some things to whet your appetite if you like. Um, and uh, after that, I'm going to get my uh, screen set up for you. So Jess, can you just give me a thumbs up if you can see the PowerPoint okay? Great. And uh, just a second one, if uh, you are not seeing it weirdly yellow, it's mostly white. Okay, that's good. 
Uh, okay, great. Um, well, uh, as Jess mentioned, I'm a research fellow with Behaviour Works Australia at Monash University, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means. Um, but uh, what I wanted to do this evening was talk a bit about my background in behavioural science um, from my training as a social psychologist um, and where I think it has potential uh, usefulness uh, for uh, practice and theory and evaluation, particularly when we're talking about measurement. Um, we think about implementation, um, if you like piggybacking a little bit on Jess's excellent talk in April, um, and also really when we're when we're thinking about behavior and we're thinking about influencing behavior, um, you know, it's humans all the way down. So what are some uh, potential tips and tricks almost um, that you can be using when you're trying to influence people in your own practice? So just as an overview of the talk, um, the really there's four kind of elements. The first is measurement, right? How do we figure out what works? Um, this is a question that I think we both share, but we come at it from different perspectives. And when you speak with other people in applied um, or allied fields, you know, a lot of people out there are trying to figure out what works. Um, and then also, you know, what comes after what works. So from a measurement perspective, I'd like to introduce the idea of behavior, behavior science, and, um, and make some suggestions about uh, how it is that we can think about behavior um, to help to unpack and understand what works. Then I want to talk a bit about, because I'm going to talk about implementation before influence, um, but uh, talking about influence. So as I said, it's from citizens to case workers to CEOs, um, it's people all the way down. So what I mean by this is when I think about how behavior and an understanding of human behavior can help you to say design a program um, or uh, think about what sorts of things are likely to change behavior that both works in terms of thinking around you know is there actually behavior change taking place as a result of an innovation or an intervention but also how can you try to encourage people to uh, take that on in their practice um, and uh, and what does it actually look like when you're rolling something out in an organization beyond um, uh, beyond i guess in my realm is sort of the the, uh, the intervention testing then implementation. So if we know what works to be change behavior, then why don't we live in a perfect world? Surely if all we need to know is, um, is uh, figuring out what works, then, uh, then the rest should take care of itself. Um, and Jess has talked a lot uh, about implementation. I know that many of you will have practice experience in this area. What I wanna do is talk a little bit about the relationship between um, what I see as implementation and scale up and where behavior can play in that space as well. And then finally, um, I think I come here in a, uh, you know, with a trying to keep, keep a sense of humility. There can be a lot of um, jazz spoken about uh, behavior science, behavior insights, nudges, things like that. But I know um, that behavior science isn't the answer. Um, it can help. Um, and I have some, um, I have some known unknowns, if you like, um, but I'm really interested in hearing uh, what my unknown unknowns are um, and hearing from you about, you know, what's, what's missing um, this talk, you know, how useful it is for you and, and uh, what some of the, the insights are that you can apply to your own practice. So uh, just gave a great introduction. Yep. My name is Zan Sari, Alexander Sari. Um, if you're wondering where the Zan came from, I'm a research fellow with Behaviour Works, and I've been working there since 2018. And I would describe my thing as uh, amplifying the impact of evidence on practice. And this is a great thing to have because uh, it's vague enough that I can say yes to things that I want to do um, and no to things that I don't really want to do. Um, but uh, I think that it, what it really does is it tries to bind together this um, passion that I have for trying to, to trying to i guess broker the relationship between science um, and practice and that's something that took me out of the much more traditional academic route and into the applied work that i do with behavior works where every one of our projects is in partnership with an organization or a government department and the questions that we have are really driven by the needs um, of the people that we work with um, so i um, i guess my expertise is really in methodology um, is in us asking interesting questions um, and this is a great space for me to play in. So I work on lots of things, but 
This includes social science experiments, evidence synthesis, um, systems transformations and transitions, things like that. The specifics of the sorts of projects that I do, and you're very welcome to ask me more details about any of these, but um, this is some of the stuff that I'm working on right now. Um, one is around the circular economy. So the complexity of waste, waste management and uh, resource use in Australia and globally um, is one that I thought I would have a crack at. Um, and so I'm actually working uh, with a group of people um, trying to understand what are the key barriers for business in adopting circular economy practices. And the answer is it's extremely complicated. Um, and this has really uh, dialed up the humility um, from my perspective. But uh, where we've been doing a lot of work um, trying to understand and connect businesses, academics and um, government in thinking about how we can transition or shift to the circular economy. And I'll revisit this question around transitions later. The other thing I've been working on as well is uh, how is it that we could scale up uh, behavior change interventions. This has a lot of overlap with the idea of implementation. I'll talk about this a bit more. Um, but really here we're saying that a lot of the um, a lot of the attention and, and uh, resources are given towards testing interventions, particularly sort of through in the, in the behavioral science space, and much less about actually ensuring that they're going to work in practice um, and thinking about how they might be adapted. Uh, where, what are the magic ingredients? Um, what are the, all the other sort of contextual information that we need to keep in mind? And then finally, um, uh, I've actually experienced a lot of the uh, global pandemic through more of a um, scientific lens, you know, living in a privileged position that I am. Um, and uh, in the early days of, the, of, uh, of COVID-19, I and a group of collaborators uh, started a, a piece of work to try to understand, measure um, and predict um, behaviours in, um, in that context. So the text here might be quite small for you, but um, we've actually done multiple waves trying to uh, measure what's the prevalence of hand washing behaviour uh, touching your face with unwashed hands, staying at home, um, and the specific behaviors we're asking about are changing over time. So for those of you who can see the red bar there, that's um, prevalence of people, uh, willingness to use the COVID safe mobile phone app in public. Um, when we saw uh, how strongly split that was, I thought that was a coding error, but we, uh, but we did find that it was very, very split in a way that many of these other behaviors were not. Um, I don't want to belabor, uh, you know, the the, um, uh, the discussion of you know what behaviour works is and what it does, um, as well as the Monash Sustainable Development Institute. But what I think I just want to highlight here is um, the point I made before about how so much of our work is done in conjunction with partners, um, and so each of the projects that I just described, um, they themselves are part of either the Victorian government or an, or a uh, national consortium um, investigating waste in the circular economy, and a lot of us at Behaviour Works. Um, have come to it from different disciplinary backgrounds. So I've come to it from a social psychology background. Um, others have come from tourism, uh, economics, ecology, conservation, um, health, things like that. And the work that we do is located within the Monash Sustainable Development Institute. And uh, sustainable development, for those of you who aren't familiar, is really about thinking, you know, what is the sort of world that we want to build um, going forward, how do we manage and navigate the tension between economic, uh, ecological and social needs and development? Um, and so uh, United Nations member nations have signed on to the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. And a lot of our work at Behaviour Works and within the Institute is guided by uh, seeking to try and address these goals. But what I'm really here to talk about today is behaviour science. Um, and thinking specifically about um, how is it that behaviour science kind of works or plays in the world? Um, what is it that I think of as it being able to offer in terms of value? Um, and then we'll unpack that through these different ideas of measurement, uh, influence and uh, implementation. So behaviours are observable events. Um, a behaviour is uh, not an attitude that people hold or a um, uh, or, or belief. Um, it's not something that is um, to do with, say, dollars spent, except insofar as we're talking about it's a person doing the spending. Um, and so uh, one of the ways that uh, I like to think about it is um, it's something's a behavior if you're able to imagine uh, someone in a room uh, actually you know, doing the thing and you had a clipboard in front of you and you could like tick things off. 
Um, so you can't measure sort of healthcare utilization um, a, a, as a word by itself, but you could measure, for example, you know, how many people are walking through the doors of an emergency ward, how many people are being admitted, um, how many people are taking the medication that they've been prescribed, um, how many people are washing their hands uh, every time they uh, get home from being outside in the context of COVID-19. And so really then like, why is it that we care about uh, behavior or behavior science? Um, and uh, I think that there are probably three reasons. Um, one of the reasons is that, you know, a behavior change or a behavior science approach, it does work. And this is more about thinking through things from like a behavior change intervention lens. So um, over the past uh, 60 years in Victoria, um, there was a peak in uh, road fatalities in 1960s. Um, and so the government started to introduce a series of interventions to try and change driver behavior. And so this might be legislation, um, it might be a redesign of, of uh, the, the cars themselves, um, road rules, things like that. Um, and so actually it was the uh, introduction of compulsory seatbelts in Victoria that was the first in the nation. And so what this really means is that thinking about things through how is it that you can try and change behavioral lens um, can work to reduce, uh, reduce the sorts of road fatalities that we're talking about. The second element is that it can be cheaper than other approaches. Now, I think it's important here to consider, you know, we don't want to be talking about a false economy where we simply solve the symptom of the issue, but the underlying kind of uh, uh, the underlying cause is, is retained. But if we consider um, in the millennium drought, there was many different changes that were made in order to try and uh, encourage water conservation behavior. And um, in Victoria, again, one of the proposed ways in which uh, the drought was supposed to be combated was through um, a, a desalinization plant, um, which was going to cost about $6 billion. Um, however, there was also a public engagement campaign um, emphasizing behavior, uh, behavior change and thinking about how is it that we can change uh, people's individual householder behavior. Um, and uh, about the same amount of water was saved that the desalinization plant was going to, uh, was going to produce. Um, and the cost of that was $30 million compared to $6 billion. Um, and then uh, finally, there's a way in which I think focusing on behavior um, can be, whoops, excuse me, focusing on behavior can be a really useful way to, um, I guess, accelerate the process of looking for the sort of social change or making progress on social problems that we care about. Um, and so Behaviour Works uh, was working with the New South Wales government, uh, now the Department of Primary uh, Industries and Environment, to try to support householders with um, energy savings. And so actually um, taking this approach, you know, the, the, uh, the technological uh, innovations in terms of insulation, solar, PV, things like that were available, but it was the behaviour change approach that was able to get people to actually install and see the benefits of those technologies. So thinking about um, behavior science as an approach to grappling with social issues, and one of the things that really draws me to it is that it works, um, it can be cheaper than sort of a technological or, or um, a purely uh, policy approach, and it can uh, be faster than a complement technology. And uh, for, uh, when we think about behavior change as a method or as a general method for behavior change, we can see that there are many different sort of activities that, um, that can be part of that. This is the, what we call the behavior works method for, uh, for behavior change. And here we talk, we can see that there's um, really three major phases. We try to explore and understand the problem. We do a deep dive into trying to unpack and identify what might work to change. And then we apply what we've learned in order to uh, see if we can get some impact. And so there is uh, a fair amount of overlap between the sort of activities that we would do and the activities that um, I can, I know that uh, you would do in your, in your practice work. But the, I see the difference is that we really consider um, the artifact of a behavior to be the thing that uh, connects us through. So just as an example, um, what we try to do by the end of the exploration phase is figure out, well, what is the actual thing that we need to change from a behavioral perspective? I'll explore that in the, um, in the measurement section. And then 
we try to figure out, well, what are there interventions out there that might influence that behavior? And then finally, we would typically try to test that intervention or provide advice and, um, and help to measure the impact of that interventional innovation. Just as examples for uh, how this might work in projects that we've done. So there are many different behaviors that, um, uh, that uh, anyone could do in any particular social issue. Um, and one of the ones we were interested in is trying to conserve water. Um, and so uh, what we have done um, is to try to understand like how we might prioritize which behaviors to actually target. Um, as you would know, right, selecting the correct outcome to um, identify change is really critical. And prioritization is really a necessary step here because there are so many different behaviors that you know, seem like they might be relevant. Um, but actually might have no impact or might be too hard to change or might not be the right audience that we're looking to try and change. When we think about deep diving, once we've identified a particular um, behavior or set of behaviors, um, really this is about trying to understand uh, what is it that's leading to that behavior. So you know, in typical parlance, this might be drivers or barriers, or it might be taking a theoretical approach to try and understand um, what it is that's causing those behaviors. And then finally, um, uh, we do quite a lot of work uh, through trials. Sometimes this is uh, randomized control trials, but also case control, uh, pre-post, um, uh, or supporting uh, others work uh, in, in evaluating or measuring the impact of uh, campaigns, interventions, and programs. So in this case, um, there was a number of uh, SMS uh, text messages sent to parents to try and remind them to uh, bring their child or sign a consent form for their child um, so that they could get vaccinated and we use different techniques both to design the intervention but also to try and promote participation in that um, in that trial so that's the overview for behavior science what i'd like to do now is really talk about measurement in some detail and where i see behavior can sit in the context of measurement um, but I'm just looking to just to see if there was anything that uh, we need to talk about first. No? Great. Sure. So I do encourage, if, you, if there are any questions, clarifying questions, please do pop them in chat. Um, I'm happy to, to pause and, uh, and discuss them. So behaviour and measurement. I really think of as being going hand in hand. Specifying a target behavior is crucial to measure any real change. And there are theories of behavior change that help to design effective interventions, as well as understand like why it is that interventions work or don't work. So one of the pieces of work that I mentioned that I've been doing is in the context of COVID-19 and trying to understand what it is that's leading people to um, to take different protective behaviors or not take those behaviors. And so typically when we think about uh, trying to say, you know, have some sort of impact on a problem or an issue, um, what I find a lot of the time is when I'm talking with partners or talking with people who see this as a big problem, um, they see the, the problem, so the blue element, um, and then the gray elements are what they immediately jump to. So they say, why don't we do radio advertisement to try and get people to do something? Um, why don't we make announcements to try and reduce community transmission of COVID-19? They're not really thinking about the connective tissue, as I described, it, which are really the behaviors. So they start with a problem um, and then uh, often they'll jump to a solution. And uh, actually that has prompted me to just add a couple of extra questions here. Um, so I've just uh, just dumped in a couple of extra questions um, that uh, that I'd like you to kind of reflect on and think about over the course of uh, of me discussing this uh, measurement. So thinking about you know what is it that you need to prioritize in your work when people or stakeholders that you work with keep skipping over X and want to talk about Y, what are X and Y? So in my case, um, they keep skipping over talking about the problem and the behaviors and want to talk about solutions. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, what is it that you find difficult about measuring kind of the in-betweens? Um, oh, was there a question there already? 
Jess? Zan, there was a, a comment um, that uh, in responding to your question about well, what really is behaviour? And there's a comment here saying, well, fundamentally, it's what people do. And it's important because programs and, and programs and policies that we seek to evaluate in turn seek to influence behavior in some ways. So behavior may be understood as the key to understanding impact. Would you make a comment on that, Zen? So um, I feel like it's almost a Dorothy Dixer. That's a fantastic. I actually really like that, like that comment. And I agree that um, thinking about what it is that uh, what impact looks like in an observable way, like what does it actually mean for there to be impact in the programs that you're evaluating? Um, what I say is, well, what is it that people are doing differently? And often a thing that can help cut through um, these the initial discussions that I'll have with a partner where they say, oh, we're trying to solve problem X and I think that we should be having radio advertisements to get people to do it is to say, okay, but what is it that you want people to do? Like who um, who do you want to do what differently? That's a it's kind of a common refrain of ours because um, it might be the case that a radio advertisement is a useful intervention or a useful communications avenue, but, but what is it actually trying to cause in terms of change? And then having an idea of how it is that that behavior or prioritizing that behavior against other behaviors are going to have any kind of impact on the overall problem. That's the crux of what a behavior science approach can, uh, can address. Then are you happy to take a couple more questions right now? Yeah, some let's do them now. Coming through. Sure. Um, there's, a, there's a question in here about uh, whether there are any behavior change initiatives that just cannot be cracked. Like, is there a too hard basket or have we just not found the right angle yet? Like, are there things that behavioural science cannot tackle? Is, I think the Ab absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think that if anyone ever tries to tell you that that they have they have the tool that can do everything, then uh, then you should look at them very closely. Um, so my, and I'll talk about this a little bit later on as well. But for me, um, one of the things that I think is very difficult is when there's um, motivated, uh, I guess, motivated kind of intransigence. Um, so, say for example. Uh, a behavior change approach, and this is to do with interventions, but a behavior change approach or a nudge has been used to emphasize the positive uh, sort of social norm of per se paying your tax on time to great effect in many different countries. It's a pretty robust uh, effect. But of course, uh, this is mostly gonna be influencing the behavior of people who, uh, who are looking for a way to perhaps minimize their tax um, or who are forgetful about paying the tax. It's not uh, going to be uh, stopping people who are actively trying to, to defraud the government. And so I think that for certain types of approaches, um, what we often would describe is that you can have kind of change everyone's behavior a little bit, or if you had a really rich understanding of those fraudsters' behavior, what were the drivers for them, then potentially you'd be able to think about the, the, an intervention that would um, effectively change their behavior. But often it's the case that um, we're really talking about, you know, is there a general kind of improvement in people's behaviors that we can be addressing? I guess another domain is really in complex, excuse me, is really in complex systems. Um, and I, um, I might speak to that a bit later as well. And uh, there's one um, great response that's come through to one of your questions, Zan. Um, one of your questions was when when the people that we work with keep skipping over X and instead want to go straight to Y, what are X and Y? And there's a response in the chat saying skipping to methods without thinking of the question properly. I feel like that's a good summary of uh, some of what you were just sharing. Would you like to respond to that a little? Yep, I think that's a um, that's also an issue that we face. Um, I think that methods I mean, I, I just would, would want to check that I understand this correctly, but I'm thinking it's like, you know, how you might measure X or how you might go about um, designing an, an effective evaluation of program X without thinking about what are the kind of key questions that you're trying to actually answer. Um, so my perspective on that would be that's an issue that I often confront. Um, although I think that, that I would say that people would 
typically come and say, well, we have a solution or we think that this solution will work. Um, and that's a real, really um, important assumption, I think, to, to try and uh, challenge. Another assumption is that um, people think they know, uh, they understand the user audience or, the, or what it is that drives the behavior among the users. But if you're talking to, you know, a, a high level bureaucrat um, and they have, you know, an encyclopedic knowledge of tax law, um, they don't necessarily understand the, the experience of, um, of all of the people who are trying to file their tax returns as well as doing a million other things every day. Thanks, Zen. Maybe um, we'll hand back over to you for a while and I'll keep monitoring the chat and we'll jump back in at the next break point. Is that okay? Yep, absolutely. Thanks, Jess. So um, I think maybe just to kind of take some of those elements and, and kind of bring them back to the discussion that we're, that, that we're having now. When I talk about measurement of behaviour um, or the relationship between measurement and behaviour, what I'm really trying to emphasise is that along the way that I think about um, what it means to have impact on a particular problem, such as say reducing community transition, transmission, it's important to um, be very clear and specific about, this, about the particular types of behaviours that you want. And um, the reason is because being able to precisely specify the behaviour both helps you to measure it effectively, but it also helps you to begin to diagnose it which is to say it begins to help you figure out what sorts of um, things are causing that behaviour and then that helps you figure out what sorts of interventions might influence it. So just as an example here, if we uh, think about it through this sort of lens, so the problem um, and down the bottom I have uh, kind of suggested some of the ways that uh, uh, as evaluators we might talk about this but if we think about the problem you know the community spread of COVID-19 well this is something that we would hope would be influenced by a change in target behavior right? um, and whatever it is that target behavior is maybe it's hand washing maybe it's staying home maybe it's something else um, here I'm talking about citizen behavior and then the question is kind of going from before that well then what is it that is changing in a person that's leading them to actually make that behavior change you know have they changed their attitude have they changed their assessment of the risk of the situation are they getting influenced by other people have they just forgotten to do it and an intervention that reminds them to do it would do it but the that green box the how does it lead to behavior change that depends on what the target behavior is so as i said when i talk with um, people often we'll talk about the problem and we'll have a bit of a sense of, a prob of the problem and then we'll try and jump to the intervention. But without understanding the elements in between, um, then we can't get there. And uh, so if you like, this is, you know, a bit of a logic or a, or a theory of change. And I would describe it as like a theory of behaviour change for making impact on, um, on these sorts of problems. So if one of the issues that we have is that um, even after we've kind of clearly specified the problem, um, more, much more clearly than, than this one liner, we would need to be able to be really clear um, about what it is that we want to change when it comes to this, to the specific target behavior. Um, and uh, to do that, we can use um, a, uh, a framework called ATACT. So this is, this is really about being clear about the audience, the target, the action, the context, and the time of the behavior. Um, so, you know, who we want to perform the behaviour, what it is that they're doing, um, you know, where they're doing it um, and, and when they're doing it. And, you know, this is a bit abstract, so let me just give you an example. So, in this, in this case, um, an example of, of a behaviour for, say, washing your hands, um, you would need to specify the behaviour really, really clearly because changing pieces of the ATACT changes the behavior and then might change, for example, uh, you know, how prevalent it is. Um, what are the drivers of the behavior? Uh, what is it that an intervention would act upon? So in this case, say that we've, just, just, we've chosen or we're in investigating a behavior that's about a visitor to a home, uh, washing their hand for 20 seconds in the bathroom sink um, once they enter the premises, you know, at the very beginning of their visit to the premises. So, uh, just saying washing your hands isn't sufficiently um, kind of descriptive because here's another case of, you know, hand washing behavior, which is very different. 
you know, home cooks washing their vegetables under running water in a kitchen sink while preparing a meal. The audience is different. Um, the target is different. The action is the same. Um, so it's still hand washing, but the context and the time are different. And so if we're thinking about um, trying to be very clear about the specifics of a target behavior, um, and then that will allow us to then look for opportunities to intervene on that behavior or otherwise measure how it is that an existing intervention or program is supposed to influence um, that particular behavior. So when it comes to selecting a target behavior, as I mentioned, there are many different possible behaviors that would have some sort of impact on the problem that we care about. Um, and uh, uh, issue that we constantly run into is one of prioritization. So there are kind of a couple of ways to look at this. One is to look at this through, um, I guess, a, you know, evaluation questions lens. So we say, what is the questions that we're trying to answer? Then how can, you know, one of these outcomes help us to determine whether that change is actually being made? The way that we look at it is often um, that we're, we have a general sort of uh, area so we're saying, because we're often more involved in designing the intervention ourselves or making recommendations for a new intervention or a new program. Um, and in this case, there might be, you know, many different types of behaviours that uh, householders could adopt to, uh, to save water in this particular figure. Um, and what we need to do is figure out, well, which of the behaviours that are up for grabs would actually have an impact on the problem, but also could feasibly be promoted for adoption. That is to say, where we potentially could have an intervention that could intervene upon it. You know, is that within the scope of the, um, of, of the discussion that we're having with a partner? Is, is that a policy level lever that that, uh, that, that organization has? Um, is it something that they are, you know, empowered to actually do? Um, so it might be the case that there are certain types of behaviors that are just sort of off limits in that context. So, I've seen a lot of activity in the chat. I might just um, finish a couple of extra discussions to flesh out this idea of, of measurement through a behavioral lens, and then I'm very keen to, to discuss a bit more. So just for the sake of argument, um, uh, because we don't have six months of work uh, to do, but uh, for the sake of argument, if you imagine that we did a prioritization exercise and we said, one of the key places where we potentially would get community spread of COVID-19 is where visitors come into a household and, um, and they bring, uh, bring it with them, right? And, and it's because they've touched something. Um, now, I'm not an epidemiologist, okay? Uh, so uh, I would defer to, to, to that judgment. But essentially what I'm saying is, um, if it was the case that this was considered to be a behavior that a lot of people were doing, but we think we could change, um, and it was something uh, that would have quite a lot of impact on community transmission, then we would pick this behavior as the target. And then we would say, okay, if this is the behavior that we care about, going back to that question of the ATACT idea, right? It's when people enter a house, they're doing it with soap and water, you know, they're doing it in the bathroom um, uh, and, and it's visitors, it's visitors, right? Rather than householders. Then all of those pieces of information help us to, uh, to ask questions about that green box, right? What it is that might be actually influential in changing people's behavior. And this is where this sort of deep dive idea comes in. So I'm just gonna flash up uh, a, um, a model for uh, a theory of behavior change. And so this is um, a widely used model in, in health. Um, I thoroughly recommend uh, this book or this, this perspective. It's called The Behavior Change Wheel. Uh, and the model is called COMB, which is short for Capability, Opportunity, and Motivation. And what this model describes is that when you're thinking about um, behaviors, I mean, especially health behaviors, really, if people have the capability, the opportunity, and the motivation to do the behavior, then they will do it. So if we think about that example of the hand washing, well, it could be the case that people are, um, they don't have the opportunity to do it. That is to say, you know, there's, there's nowhere to wash their hands. There's no soap available. It could be that they don't have the capability to do it. Maybe they don't know how to wash their hands or they forget um, that that's something that they should be doing. Or it could be the motivation. That is to say that they don't think that it makes any difference um, or it's awkward, um, awkward for them to do it sort of in front of their friends. It makes, makes, uh, makes them feel uncomfortable. And so this would be kind of the, the instigating question 
that you then would actually go and talk to people or look at the evidence to understand what are the sorts of things that are influencing people's uh, willingness to do this behavior or similar behaviors. And that then leads us to um, kind of a, a richer understanding of the key things that are gonna influence that behavior. Um, so for example, um, we think that it's important that a social norm is of hand washing is communicated um, and that people forget. They, they, they would, they're happy to do it, but they just forget. Um, and so that might then imply that if there was say a poster that was at the front of the, um, uh, of the door, um, then that might help to uh, both communicate the social norm and communicate the reminder. But if there was a radio advertisement, well, they're not listening to a radio advertisement at the time that they enter the person's house. So they're not gonna be able to uh, have that radio advertisement actually kind of uh, influence their behavior at that, at that time, at that moment. It might be useful if the radio advertisement was, um, was you know, playing in the shopping center um, and it was about you know, keeping distance from other people while they're in the shopping center, right? Then it would be more congruent with that particular behavior. So when we think about then, you know, measurement through a behavioral lens, then this is one example of how we might um, try and uh, use a, a behavioral approach to really pin down the particular element that we want to measure. So, so for example, if we're able to measure visions as washing the hands, we're entering the house, and we already believe or we've prioritized that to have an impact on community spread, then if we measure hand washing behavior, and we've designed the intervention or we measure the question of are they being reminded, are they getting the social norm information, um, then we have a much better understanding of did the intervention or the program, the communications campaign, um, does it actually influence people's, uh, uh, people's behavior and therefore have an impact on the problem. Um, so I'm just checking something briefly. Um, yeah, okay, great. So uh, really then what I see is some of the implications for measurement. Um, that I would recommend you consider is really to think about well, what are the behavioral outcomes that you care about? So when you're thinking about the questions that you're posing, what that might, what might that look like? Who needs to do what differently? Um, reflecting on the idea of precise specification being really necessary. And then also thinking about if you have a, say a behavioral theory of change, um, then how is it that whatever the intervention is that either you're testing or um, you're evaluating, how was it supposed to influence behavioral outcomes um, in addition to you know, utilization and cost and other types of questions you care about? So uh, I just break there. These are the same questions that I asked earlier. Uh, you can see a nice orange cast to my face with it on the screen. Um, and uh, Jess, I saw there's a bit of activity, so I'm happy for you to um, go ahead. Yeah, great. Thanks, Zan. Um, there's some great questions and comments coming through. I'm going to start with one that um, specifically gets at measurement. Uh, the question, I think, is really about to what extent does it matter that people are doing the behaviour for the right reason versus uh, to what extent does it just matter that the behaviour is habituated and, and happens? So the way this relates to measurement is what is it important to measure? Is it important to measure just the observable behaviour or is it also important to measure whether people, to assess whether people have like the, the right rationale behind the behaviour? This is an excellent question and I think one that um, might have a different answer depending on the scope of, of, of your work or your role. So we, and um, yeah, so we will work at lots of different levels. Sometimes an intervention has already been developed and we are being asked to, you know, uh, behavior it up, right? Sometimes um, it's been developed and rolled out um, and we're asked to, uh, to essentially determine whether it worked and why. And sometimes we have a blank slate. Sometimes there's a, there's a problem that we've been asked to, um, to figure out how we can make a change on. And in each of those cases, the question of the importance of say measuring those, those drivers versus focusing on the behavior, the importance goes up and down. So in a case where we have proposed a new way or a new intervention that we think will change people's behavior, um, uh, so, 
um, say, for example, uh, a project that I've worked on is we proposed a new way that we could get people to be more honest when filling out paperwork, uh, what transferring registration. So there was an issue with people kind of uh, stretching the truth on some of the declarations. So we were, we had an idea about what might work, but uh, if we only measured the behavior, only measured whether people did it or not, we, and it didn't work, then we wouldn't be able to make any kind of recommendations about what the partner or what we should do next. Um, so uh, we tested a bunch of different elements. We designed the intervention in a way that we thought would have certain types of influences on drivers. Um, and then we, uh, then we measured the behavior, but we also measured those particular you know, behavioral drivers. The next stage after that was going to be a kind of a field trial in which um, the organization was actually planning to change the, uh, the forms themselves. And in that case, there would be no way for us to access those sorts of behavioral drivers, but it had already been done. And so then we'd kind of know what was relevant, what was, if you like, the magic ingredient of the intervention that made it change behavior. But if we didn't have any idea about what made it change behavior, then if it worked or not, that would be the only piece of information that we would have. We would only know if it worked or not, we wouldn't know why. And I also think that's really important when it comes to implementation and scale up, is understanding clearly what it is about an innovation or an in intervention that made it work, because there's always gonna be adaptations in another context and knowing what it is that made it work is gonna help that adaptation. That's great, Zan, thank you. And possibly related to this, there's been a, a really good question about understanding the context within which you're working and the example is specifically culture so to what extent um, does it matter that we would might need to first understand things like values relationship to authority collectivism in a in a context before we could propose a solution to behavior change so i think that there's a there's kind of a um it's almost a, I don't want to say try it, but there's like a quick answer and then there's like the more nuanced answer. So the quick answer is that um, a, a rich model of behavior change or theory of behavior change tries to accommodate or recognize the fact that there are many different influences on behavior. Um, and in fact, actually, let me just jump to it right now as we're talking to it. Um, there we go. This is my second last slide of the whole talk, but on the right here, you can see that there's um, a whole bunch of overlapping elements that influence people's behavior, right? Individual level elements, community elements, structural elements, right? Which can be things, you know, as diverse as poverty or gender equity or country level values. Um, but uh, that's kind of the, the quick answer is that if you know about them in advance, then you can try and measure and grapple with them. But I think the more nuanced answer is that um, every piece of evidence that we're creating, you know, whether it's as behavior scientists or evaluators is always going to be taking place in some sort of context. And you can either quote unquote control for that as in, you know, tighten your grip on, on the program implementation so that um, it will still work, even though the culture is different. Um, or you can uh, take a different approach, which is about trying to figure out how you can adapt uh, what works into the culture in which you're working. Um, and uh, that latter one is much more difficult um, and, and takes much more time and often involves sharing power in a way that makes you know, funders and, and, um, and partners very uncomfortable. Um, and, you know, scientists are uh, quite uncomfortable. Um, so those are the two answers that I... Um, I aspire to the second approach, um, but I'm definitely guilty of the first approach. That's really helpful, Zan. I really like, um, I really like your honesty there. Thank you, and and how candid you are in your approach. Um, this is a, a potentially nice segue from that question. Um, there is often a, a criticism um, of this behavioural focus and the, um, behavioural science that it can be guilty of blaming the individual and assuming that all of the responsibility for change sits with the individual, um, rather than looking at policy or social influences. Can you speak to and unpack that tension a little bit for us? This is a good one. Um, and I realize that all of my answers so far have been really long. So I'm, I, I, I don't want to 
not give credit to this question by trying to give a shorter answer. I think that there's a, if we're thinking about individual level behavior, then it's, then the, um, the typical way that you would go about trying to quote unquote diagnose it um, is, is to think about what are the individual level influences on them, on, on that person. Um, and so in that model that I showed the capability, opportunity, and motivation that very clearly locates the, you know, the causes for people's behavior, you know, within the person. And I would say that behavioral science in general does think about that, um, does think about those influences um, primarily because a lot of the way, a lot of the, the DNA or the history of behavior science comes from places like psychology and economics and much less from places like sociology um, uh, critical theory, things like that. That has slowly started to change. Um, and I would say that there's a, a recognition of say the, the role of things like social practices where like materials and meanings are also considered to be really an important part of behavior and fostering and supporting behavior. Um, that's come out. Another element I've seen a couple of times in the chat, people talk about habits. Habits are something that's just incredibly difficult for behavioral scientists in an orthodox way to crack because they happen over time. They get reinforced by the context in which we exist. Um, I don't know that anyone has really solved habits, but it's been a thorn um, in, in my side for a long time that the tools that we have to date haven't really done a good job at grappling with them. But I think that there's still a lot of value in a behavioral approach because while by default it might emphasize the individual as being the cause of their behavior, it does not uh, oblige an individual level explanation of behavior. And so what that means is that, you know, that diagram that I've just put up briefly, I'm supervising a PhD student at the moment that's really interested in behavior around energy usage and, and empowerment um, uh, with regards to, to using energy and renewable energy. And she is really um, looking to try to expand the view beyond the individual and thinking about, you know, a community has to get together in order to say purchase a wind turbine, um, or uh, there has to be, you know, certain types of legislation in place that make it even possible for these sorts of experimentation to happen. Um, and that's the sort of uh, direction that I'm really excited that behavior science might be going. And to pick up on that, Zan, there's a couple of um, comments in the chat about the ethics of mandating particular behaviors and how far is it, how far, how far is too far in terms of uh, use of nudges or perhaps going beyond nudges, um, the use of other policy or legislation levers to kind of mandate behavior. Um, have you had, uh, do you have any thoughts or if you had any experience kind of navigating some of those murky ethical waters? Oh, yes. Um, I think that this one, I think that one of the answers that I have to this question is around, um, there is, there's constant, uh, desire for change and change in behaviors, whether this is citizen behavior or customer behavior, um, supermarkets, you know, structure their supermarkets in such a way, um, so as to try to try to cause, uh, certain types of behavior change that are not what I would describe as pro-social or good for the consumer and governments um, will uh, with or without behavioral scientists would be seeking to coerce or otherwise change or restrict or endorse certain types of behaviors. What I think that um, I think that there's definitely uh, ethical, cons ethical concerns and considerations about a behavior science approach that should not be shied away from or, you know, have this sort of what about, okay, oh, well, you know, supermarkets do it. So it's fine for us to do it. Um, but what I think of is, um, is that we approach the question of uh, understanding people's behaviors to try and meet them where they are and, and recognize that people are doing behaviors for like for satisfying particular needs for themselves or because it actually leads to outcomes that they care about in many cases. Um, and so that's why we put so much emphasis on trying to understand the system. In a couple of occasions, we've done things where we've tried to map out the system um, around a problem. And um, uh, so say, for example, working with a large organization and the issue is, is that their staffers are failing to tick some compliance box and we wanna change that person's behavior. And we map out the system and we do a thing where we show the arrows lead from people with high power to people with low power. Um, and what they found is that that particular staffer that's not doing the thing 
every arrow is leading to them and they have no power over anyone else. And so then that helps in the discussion to say, well, actually, maybe it's not their behavior that's the one that's the problem. It's we have to think about like a different person or a different group within the system that we intervene upon because you're putting too much pressure on this one person. Mm. Yeah, that's excellent, Zan. And I, I might just do one more question and then throw it back to you. Who should choose which behaviours are trying to be encouraged? I mean, we could have a philosophical discussion about the role of government and like, you know, who, who, who chooses what. Um, I think that the approach that I've always taken in my work is I've tried to think about if I was first, I say, if I was in the position where I, you know, knew more and was more compassionate and um, had more time, um, what would be the sort of behavior that I would want to take? Um, and then and then think about it from that lens. So essentially the best version of myself. But what's very important is that I'm not the person that's in, um, that's in a, uh, that knows, you know, the reasons that a person is taking particular behaviors. Because that's why it's so important for us to talk to them, um, to understand like the reasons that they're, that they're doing that. In fact, going back to that idea about uh, people stretching the truth on their registration forms. We actually went and spoke to people in line as they were going to lodge their registration forms to try and understand like what it is that's causing their behavior. And for some of them, it was, it was really interesting to figure out, you know, what it is that they thought the right thing was to do. And then that helped us to, um, to design one that, you know, was both, if you like, achieve the sorts of outcomes that, that the partner wanted, but also was compassionate and, and empathetic with the people that were being affected by it. Thank you. I Zach. really, yeah, no, I really appreciate the hard questions. In fact, I'm going to go back and listen over this recording and I'm going to turn them into, into questions that I'm going to ask of my students in the future. These are great questions. That's brilliant, Zan. I'm glad um, we're helping you as well as you're helping us. That's, that's a, a brilliant, um, uh, that's a brilliant scenario, best possible scenario. Um, what we might do, there's still some other questions in there, but maybe um, just to break it up a little, we'll hand back to you and jump back into the questions in a little while. Thanks, Jess. Um, so the other two sections here um, are a little bit shorter um, and a little bit more, I guess, focused on, you know, what I think, uh, what I think, you know, behavior has in this context. Um, rather than I, th I think kind of the extended discussion of theory um, that I had in measurement. And I hope that particularly this section on influence is you know, practically useful. Um, so let me just pop in the question that I had for you. Here we go. So, and I mean, you know, this makes me think about a lot of the discussion we've already been having, but if for the moment we can recognize that in order to um, have the positive impact that we want on the world, what we need to do is we need to influence, uh, influence people to change behavior. And as I mentioned, you know, it's, it's people all the way down. So not only are we perhaps, um, say when they're designing an intervention or, or adapting an innovation, trying to influence the target group, so the, the citizens or the visitors to our home. But we're also, um, and this comes through in, in implementation as well, we're also trying to influence the people who are supposed to be giving that brief you know, talk to the citizen um, or uh, the decision maker in the organization that might choose to fund program X and program Y um, or, or uh, a policy maker who um, is trying to figure out like, what is the right thing to do in this situation? And so the sort of ideas that I'm putting forward here are pretty, uh, pretty fun foundational, if you like, uh, behavior change concepts that I think can be picked up and used quite quickly. Um, and uh, I think that they are one of these uh, strategies or types of strategies where they work a bit for most people. Um, but of course, uh, you could also take a behavioral approach, uh, do a deep diagnosis of, you know, that one, uh, that one program manager um, and figure out like what really makes them tick uh, and then come to them with a brief that addresses, you know, their motivation, opportunity and capability. Um, but of course you would want to do that in an open, transparent and empathetic way, not in a bit of manipulative way. 
So thinking about behavioral insights for influence, there are lots of frameworks and models and acronyms out there. In fact, one that has come out just in the past month is called the behavior framework. I'm amazed that that one wasn't already taken. Um, but uh, they're all over the shop. In fact, the one you can see on the left there, Inspire, um, is, is ours. And it's actually focused on um, static communication. So letters, emails, um, uh, posters, things like that. But all of these different uh, behavioral insights for, uh, for influence uh, models and structures are not so much about, you know, preying on biases in order to nudge people in a way so as to get your way. But it's more about, um, don't, you can almost think of them as like principles for behaviorally informed design. They're trying to meet people um, in the world in which they live um, in a situation where there's many competing demands in their time. They're not always sure what the right thing is to do. Um, when they're in a situation in which they might enact the behavior, they don't remember that it's the time to do the behavior. Um, and so uh, applying some of these frameworks can be quite useful. And I'd like to um, just uh, single out a couple um, and emphasis with East. So um, this is quite an old book now, uh, Cialdini, uh, probably 30 years old actually. Um, and uh, he proposed, uh, there you go, <laughs> excellent. It's an oldie but a goodie, thanks Jess. Um, it's, it's, a, it's deeply influential for a reason. Um, and the idea is, if you want someone to do something, then applying this sort of, these sorts of elements are more likely to, to, to get it to happen. So just jumping a couple of them out, you know, in general, and this might seem pretty obvious, you know, people are strongly influenced by what other people do or what they perceive other people do. Um, now this might seem kind of, you know, uh, really pat, but actually is very important when you think about uh, in certain uh, countries in the world, including Australia, um, and you're not sure whether it's safe to go out uh, and eat at a restaurant, um, you know, as, as the restrictions are easing. But when you go out for your shopping and you see every single cafe full, you think, you might think, oh, okay, well, if those people are doing it, then probably it's okay for me to do it as well. You're not only listening to um, arguments from authority, which is number four. Um, the other elements here, um, you know, reciprocity, people return favors. So giving a little first can be persuasive. Um, people are highly motivated to be uh, to be consistent with the commitments that they've made. So if you can extract a commitment from someone to do something, particularly a public commitment, because this also relies on social proof, um, then uh, uh, then they're more likely to follow through. Um, and let me unpack this a little bit through um, through uh, slightly more easier to use East framework. So the East framework is um, is one that's developed by the Behavioral Insights team. And uh, really it's about making things easy, 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 and then also uh, emphasizing these different other elements. One of the things that I think can sometimes happen with behavioral insights and behavior science is that um, it is accessible, uh, which means that it can seem simplistic. Um, and I have no doubt that in your role as well, um, or roles as well, you've encountered the issue where people say, Oh, you know, we can, you know, we already have a team that's able to do X or, um, yeah, I know, I'll know that it works once I see it. Um, and I think that in these cases, you know, I'm, I'm emphasizing the fact that all of these are uh, what I would call Pareto improvements. So they're likely to be very low cost, um, but they potentially going to increase the likelihood of getting the behavior change that you care about. And the specific things I'm thinking about here are you want to uh, interview a bunch of people. Um, so that you can ask them what their experience of a program has been. Um, but when you e email them, they're not reply. Um, or um, you're trying to uh, design a form that will be uh, taken up and boost participation rate uh, in a survey, um, but you stubbornly it's staying really low. People aren't replying uh, to, to a particular email. Um, or you uh, have an opportunity to adapt uh, an intervention for a new context. Um, but uh, the intervention is in, is in like a different language or uses a, a format that's not really appropriate. You're not really sure how it is that you can still get the same sort of effects um, in your new context or in your population. So here are a couple of ideas. One, make it easy. Um, so simple messages that are, um, you know, using default. So getting people to opt out of something that, that, that they would otherwise uh, benefit from and, and would 
you know, in their best self benefit from, um, or, or give people reminders, uh, text messages um, that remind people to, to go to the dentist are much more effective than any amount of advertising. Um, personalizing, uh, creating a sense of urgency and using uh, sort of effective incentives are all things that can make uh, certain types of behavior more attractive. Um, and so in general, you know, people are not necessarily in a situation where they reject requests out of hand, but making something easier to do um, is almost always going to make people more likely to do it. Um, so uh, sending an email saying we should all get together in the next week um, is, uh, is not as easy as here's a doodle poll link for everyone to sign in and, uh, and indicate their availability is not as easy as um, I checked with the three other people um, who need to attend this meeting and we can all make 7 p.m. Uh, can you make 7 p.m. or not, right? Um, so uh, making it easy, uh, making it attractive, um, and then also making it social and making it timely. So people are influenced by what other people do and what they expect. Um, you, using sort of influential hosts or messages and reminding people of shared commitments are also useful here. Um, and timeliness is also, I think, connected in some ways to, to habituation. So consider uh, what we call moments that matter. So these are really cases in which uh, people have changed a context. You know, maybe they've are starting a new job. Um, they're moving in together with uh, uh, with their partner. Um, they're they're adopting a new uh, a new way of exercising. Um, these are all times in which people's typical patterns and habits are disrupted. And that makes it makes them more uh, open to um, and able to be uh, have their behavior changed. So, um, you know, this might be simple, but sometimes I uh, schedule my uh, emails to a high status and very time poor person uh, to arrive in the inbox uh, at uh, seven in the morning because I know that's what time that they uh, they like start checking their email. And you know, if you get a notification, then you're like, oh, I wonder what that is. Well, that's my, uh, that's my little hack for making sure that they see my emails in, in a bunch of other people. So these are all, yes, I said, you know, costless improvements that can help uh, change lots of people's behaviors a little bit. Um, and that I also help, uh, I hope, um, uh, get the sorts of behavior changes that you need in your daily role. But of course we can, you know, we can, we can dig deeper, right? As I mentioned, if there are particular groups that you care about, um, or, or individuals you're trying to understand why they're doing the things that they do, how might they change their behavior, then you can apply, you know, a richer idea like this. So one of the case studies that's discussed in, um, in the COMB book is uh, about hospital workers uh, failing to kind of wash their hands. And it's had a pernicious effect because both, uh, you know, the risk of infection was very significant, but also it was the case that um, when people weren't washing their hands, they were giving social norm to other people and then that led them to not wash their hands. And so they had to come up with strategies that were really targeted towards the relatively high status people in the hospital in order to understand, diagnose and change the behavior of those people. Um, of course, making it easy, attractive, social and timely for people to wash their hands could improve somewhat. Um, but if you really want a significant behavior change, a bit like the element we covered in measurement, that's where you want to go. So um, that's it for influence. Here are a couple of the questions that I mentioned earlier. Um, I do see that it's quarter to seven. So I'm happy, Jess, whether you'd like to field a couple of me to field a couple of questions now or whether to continue. Uh, let's do a couple of questions now, right. if you don't mind, sure. Zan, because um, there's a couple that relate specifically to what you've been talking about. There's one that I'll maybe just mention rather than pose to you, because I actually think you've already answered it. And the question or the comment was around um, disruptive no moments where habitual behaviours might get somewhat unfrozen, and you already talked about moments that matter, so mm -hmm. we can probably um, leave that one there. Um, to your question, whose behaviour do you need to change in order to increase the impact? Um, there's a, a great question here that a couple of people have weighed in on um, that gets at that kind of uh, citizen power. So from a citizen perspective, how might we be able to influence government behaviour in policy development? So rather than thinking about the policy makers trying to use strategies to nudge citizen behaviour, Mm. Is there anything you would say about uh, about flipping it? So this is, um, I think this is a really good question because it does, like citizen behaviour is 
would can be powerful, but it's not, it doesn't come from a place of say structural power in the way that like a government maybe does. So, you know, in a way there's a might makes right perspective where the government assumes that it has um, the legitimacy to change citizen behavior because of the fact that it can. Um, whereas like citizens need to fight for the right to be able to you know, change their government behavior. So speaking to that, like I, one of the things that I would do in this situation is think about, well, what is what is that like can you identify the particular person that needs to be changing their behavior like who is the person or the groups that need to change their behavior and what are the influences on their behavior and when we say things like incentives um or oh you know they're reinforced to do x because they want to keep their job or whatever i mean that's one level of understanding it but i also think that there's um there's other levels in which say um uh, if you think about sort of the motivation, the capability, and the opportunity of whether it's a policymaker or a person implementing a program, um, and uh, look for ways in which uh, they don't have the capability or the opportunity or the motivation to adopt the behavior that you care about, um, and then think about well, what is it that you could do in order to make that tweak? And again, like, is the behavior you know implementing a program that you think is important? Well, what would it look like for that to happen? Well, first it might be a meeting or first first it might be like attending a, a presentation um and and then it might be a, some sort of commitment to you know investigate something or do a needs analysis or something breaking things down from a behavioral perspective can also help to make them a bit more manageable rather than thinking about the end goal and saying well what we really want is someone to endorse the whole process to get to the end goal Thanks, Sam. And I might just pose one other question now and, and we'll try to hold the others over for if we have time. The final question I want to pose right now is about the unintended consequences of behaviour change of the majority. And so this question is getting at what, could, what might be the negative unintended consequences of behaviour change of the majority on vulnerable or marginalised communities and cultures? And the comment is, was an observational one that none of the models that you um, presented kind of explicitly get at that. This is something that I, honestly, that I struggle with. Um, and it's influenced by um, a personal connection I have to, a, to someone who um, did a piece of work that was done typically with Australian citizens um, and uh, was asked to repeat the work um, repeat the work um, with uh, an Indigenous Australian uh, Torres Strait Islander population. Um, and a lot of the assumptions that came into that work um, just were, you know, not compatible. Um, now, that's not really, that's not purely a behaviour change perspective, but, you know, the, the personal connection with, um, with that work really made me reflect on this, this difficult question of, you know, who is it that we are seeking to try to serve and at what cost? Um, you know, who, who is it that's either getting left behind or getting caught up in this element? Um, and, you know, speaking as an academic, like, I think that certain types of interventions that uh, might look good on paper, like the robo-debt scheme, um, are, have all sorts of pernicious consequences that were just not considered at the time. One of the ways that I would hope that we can address that while recognizing that's not really enough, is to say how, like when it is, when it comes time to um, understand the people who are enacting behaviors, um, how do we make sure that we're speaking to them and hearing their voice? One of the things that we have done, um, although unfortunately I can't speak to it in detail because I haven't personally been involved, is uh, what we call stakeholder uh, dialogues um, or stakeholder forums, where when we're working in an area, for example, in say farm safety, um, or uh, in an area of, uh, say, uh, um, long-term uh, disability resulting from, uh, from injuries, uh, motor vehicle accidents, what we'll do is we'll specifically try to uh, speak with um, a range of people who are, say, experiencing the issue at different levels of severity and make a lot of, uh, uh, really emphasise, like, the importance of speaking to the people who might be adversely affected by a particular um, type of behaviour change. But I think that fundamentally, um, the sort of work that that I I would typically do, or that I would feel most comfortable doing, would really about trying to shift, you know, the majority. Um, and and I agree, probably doesn't pay enough attention to the people who um, would be adversely impacted as a result. 
Thanks, Sam. I'm going to hand over to you for the last uh, 10 minutes or so. And if we happen to have some time at the end, we can revisit some of the other questions. Thanks, Jess. So the last, oh, there you go. The last section that I wanted to discuss was implementation. Um, and um, here I was thinking, oh, you know, I'll talk about implementation. Um, and then I watched Jess's excellent talk uh, on implementation and, and measurement. Um, and so I think what I really wanted to do was just talk about my journey through thinking about implementation in the behavior science, um, I guess, sort of perspective, and a little bit about some of the work that I've done um, trying to understand implementation and scale up and where it is that I think that, again, kind of some of the ideas from behavior science can help uh, help in these in these regards. So, of course, um, you know, our host uh, this evening just gave a great talk in April about um, about implementation science and introduced in that uh, discussion uh, the consolidated framework for implementation research. Uh, the very uh, simply named uh, and clear uh, framework. But one of the things that I think is really interesting about this is that it, it is that it tries to grapple with some of the issues that um, uh, that come up once the intervention has been tested or evaluated and determined to work for whatever variable of work. And then like what happens next? You know, if we know what works, then why aren't we living in, in, in the perfect world? And the consolidated framework for implementation research and many other um, pieces of work that have tried to grapple with this question seek to characterize the different elements that are beyond the, the specifics of the innovation or the intervention um, that can influence whether a uh, whether whether there's actually positive impact in, in the long run. So of course the innovation and the intervention itself must must work, right? Like it it has to have a change in utilization or change in behavior from my perspective. But of course, we also have to consider the environment around the organization that's trying to um, implement that change, what's happening inside the organization, the people themselves, you know, the case workers or the staff that are trying to execute, the doctors that are trying to do the, the innovation and the, the way that the whole process gets managed. That's the, the CIFA model. And one of the things that I've been grappling with is thinking about what is it that that I might bring to this sort of lens, because although the CIFA is extremely comprehensive, it doesn't really emphasize or, or um, grapple or con uh, consider, if you like, the role of behavior and behavior change in bringing, um, bringing in innovation um, and making it stick. Um, and behavior change, I think um, that is what's happening at multiple levels, right? As I said, it's people all the way down. So not only is it the case that you know, a rich description of the system can help to identify points for leverage and who needs to do what differently. If you recall my example of, you know, the person that was not being compliant, but they were the one that was being overloaded by everything else. Um, having an understanding of the inner or the outer setting helps to identify uh, where you might intervene. An organizational um, behavior approach can help to identify barriers and drivers from those literatures, right? How is it that organizations make, behave, make decisions what are the observable actions that they that they do? You know, far from COMB, which is an individual level sort of focus, and um, organizational level focus tries to tries to enrich that. And then you know, even at the point where you say, okay, let's do some training materials, let's um uh, figure out how we're going to get the case workers to uh, to deliver a brief intervention for smoking cessation, um, which we have evaluated and determined to work. Um, in a pilot trial well can the actual activities that you do in that space can they be made you know, easy attractive social and timely or can we understand what are the different demands on the case workers time um, that that is stopping them from being able to enact the behavior of delivering the intervention um, i might uh, actually just uh, jump over a couple of these slides here and talk a little bit about scale up directly so um, Implementation and scale up uh, have a somewhat uh, fractious uh, and, and in uh, history intention. Um, I would not go uh, so far as to say that, that they're the same thing, um, but there are similarities. And one of the things that I've been doing over the past while is trying to understand how it is that we might increase the reach and impact of uh, behavior change interventions. And what we've been trying to understand um, to date is like what is it that's out there already that's been done in in scaling up interventions um so 
very briefly, um, and I won't speak to the specifics of this, but what you can see is um, we're doing a program of research where we're trying to understand the evidence background for, um, for scale up. Um, we've spoken to a lot of people from the behavioral insights community, and now we're trying to speak to people outside that community to understand um, what it is that they do when they think about scale up and what it is they think of as their uh, responsibilities when it comes to scale up and implementation. And we're developing, or um, until COVID struck, um, we were developing a prototype for scaling up toolkits. And one of the, I think, benefits for us um, being a bit more agile is that we're able to pivot a bit um, and think about scaling up um, behavior change interventions in the time of COVID-19. Um, and so again, kind of recognizing uh, not wanting to bombard you with, uh, with, with texts and boxes and tables, but we're at a point right now where we're trying to figure out what are the different problems that people are facing when they're trying to evaluate and implement you know, rapid behavior change interventions to um, encourage people to say, stay at home, wash their hands, things like that. Um, and then what is it that we've already identified from our work in implementation and scale up that potentially can support some of those activities. So one quick example you can see here on the right is, you know, what's a minimum version of something that can help to identify the parts of an intervention that are actually useful so that then someone from a different uh, organization or different country can think about the elements that are relevant to to that context and make adaptations as they need to. So that was a bit of a, I guess, a bit of a, um, a, a brief skim. I'm very happy to share the slides though afterwards so you can review that in some detail. And I think the last thing I'd just like to just, just like to mention um, before we finish up is some of the gaps and open questions. Um, and I put this up before, but as you can see, um, I've really tried to cover a lot of ground in this talk. Um, but there are many elements that are gaps and, and unknowns in behavior science. And I really thank you for the questions you've asked in, um, in you know, isolating and pinpointing other elements that you know, behavior science can't speak to. Some of the ones that I've identified is really having, being able to have a good understanding and figure out where to intervene on and evaluate complex systems and a lot of focus on individual behavior. Um, and that was already kind of discussed in some detail. And I also think that there's a tension for us, for us as well as for you around rigor and impact, right? Like um, you can say, well, through rigor, you can get impact, but at the end of the day, if you're trying to um, ensure that the thing that you're doing um, does actually get taken up, um, then uh, it can be difficult to say, you know, let's put the brakes on, let's spend a bunch of time making sure that exactly how we're measuring it, exactly how we're diagnosing it um, is in the most uh, specific detail. So, um, I guess just as the final kind of uh, uh, prompt to put up, I'm asking, you know, those of my known unknowns, um, what are my unknown unknowns? Where is behavior science misleading, inadequate, or just the wrong tool for the job? Um, and then if we do have any more time, if there's any behavioral problems that you as evaluators face um, that you'd like to chat about. So thanks very much. Thank you, Zan. That's uh, absolutely brilliant. What a great tour um, through behavioural science as it applies to some of the things that evaluators really wrestle with. And uh, your, yeah, your insights and like others are saying in the chat, your humility um, has been uh, fantastic. So I really appreciate that. And likewise, really appreciated people's insightful questions, kind of really getting at the ethics of uh, of what it means to um, nudge and, and uh, control, in inverted commas, um, people's behaviour. So that's fantastic. Um, really great feedback coming through, Zan, but we probably don't have any more time for additional questions, um, if that's okay. But people are um, very much sending their, their regards and their thanks um, with someone saying, uh, it's the best webinar they've been in in ages. So, um, and that's really saying- since, Just, since, just since April, right? <laughs> no, not, not at all. Um, so we really appreciate it, Zan, and we really appreciate everybody's um, participation tonight. Um, it really makes it when people really jump in and contribute to the discussion um, and really launch off some of the fantastic content that our presenters offer us. So really appreciated. Um, thank you, everybody. And we will um, release you to your evenings and your dinners. Um, and we hope you uh, have a lovely rest of the week. Thanks.
so much, Zan, in particular, and thanks for all of our participants. Thanks very much, Jess. Um, and yep, feel free to send me an email with your with your questions, piercing or otherwise. Um, I'd love to love to receive them and love to continue to chat. Thanks, and Zan, I believe you're happy for your um, your PowerPoint slides to be circulated by the AES to registrants. Absolutely. Excellent. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks, everyone.